was, uh, I went blind when I was a freshman in high school and it was like a really rare eye disease. Um, and my brothers were both great athletes and I would listen to them on the football field or on the basketball court, pounding up the court, you know, dribbling the ball, score, you know, shooting baskets. And I wondered what I would be good at. And, uh, so I started wrestling. That was one thing I'd heard blind people could do. But I also, at the same time, um, got this newsletter in Braille. And it was a uh, group that uh, they were a rehab organization for the blind. They taught blind people how to use canes and how to use how to read Braille. And um, they had a recreational program. And they would take us out um, sailing, canoeing, uh, horseback riding, tandem biking once a month and it was really fun like what were they gonna where were they gonna take us next and one weekend they took us rock climbing in north conway new hampshire and i was sold it was the most incredible activity i'd ever pursued just feeling my way up this rock face sort of trying to unlock the puzzle in the rock with my hands and my feet uh, as my eyes uh, and it was so engaging i kept climbing and what does it feel like when you reach out with uncertainty like you don't your form you're developing the path or finding the path as you go along and have to have faith that it's there yeah how, you're right there's a how, faith element to it how do you do that and what does it feel like what's the process like and what right. does it feel like when you reach yeah. Place. Well, I mean, one thing, you know, I'm a very systematic person. I mean, Buddy and I, when we were writing the book, he, you know, um, like Buddy, you know, and I've, we've adventured together. Uh, he'll tell you, like, I'm not like a crazy risk taker. I'm not just like throwing myself into a situation <laughs> and just hoping to live through it. You know, there's always a system behind it that you're carefully developing with your team. So we're pretty methodical. But yeah, despite as methodical as you can possibly be, there are these moments where you reach out as a blind climber and you can't see beyond your hand. And you got to you gotta believe that there's something that will connect the dots to be able to connect you to get you higher up that rock face. Um, so yeah, every reach for me, I'm predicting trying to figure out like the pattern that I'm feeling under my hand and saying, is that pattern gonna, you know, and then I'm guessing and making deductions. Is that pattern going to continue to go, you know, up here to the left, to the right, you know, what's that crack going to do? Uh, so yeah, there's like all this sort of uh, deduction or guesswork, or you could say sort of faith. And yeah, and I think that's a good metaphor to uh, think about, our lives, there's always sort of like reaching into darkness. And, you know, people like to um, sort of pretend that, you know, they're very much in control. But yeah, no, there's a lot of uh, parts of our life where we're sort of reaching into darkness and, and uh, predicting and calculating and hoping and praying that we're going to find the next hold on, you know, the next rung on the ladder. Uh, but there's zero guarantee that it's going to be there. And because of that, I think a lot of people would be terrified to try, regardless of their abilities. You know, if you put eyesight aside, disability of someone aside, people are scared of the unknown and of venturing into the unknown without a guarantee. Not that there are guarantees for anything, but I know I have a seven year old daughter and she just completed a class on rock climbing. So it was nothing like what you've done. But as a mom, I had to get her from her saying, I can't, to a place where she could say, I can, to a place where she could say, I just did. Mm -hmm. What is a space between can't and can? And how do you take people, how do you get people to try? Okay, so, I mean, basically, I think pointed out in a very nice way, sort of one of the underlying premises of the book. Because 
Buddy and I didn't really want to write like a how-to book. We didn't want to write a self-help book. We wanted to write a narrative, you know, like a real memoir, but with a map. With, and I think there is kind of a hidden map within the book uh, if you read it in, in that context. Uh, and it is a messy map. It's not like a very, it's not like uh, this perfectly laid out map, you know, like we're not giving you the seven steps to success, you know, to, you know, I think that in a way I'm starting as I get older to feel like that kind of book under, you know, kind of undermines or unappreciates people's own journey, you know, because they have to find the I can inside of them. And so they need, you know, hopefully things that will help flesh out whatever they have, whatever they can grow inside them. But there, but there is a messy map. And so w the people that we, you know, studied that we really dissected in the book, great friends of mine that I've interacted with, they've, um, th you know, pat the pattern is that they go out into the world. You, you start out as a little kid with hope and optimism and excitement. And then somewhere along that ascent, things happen, things get in the way, right? You lose belief in yourself. Um, you lose belief in the cause. You, you, uh, you try 100%, you give it everything you have, and then you fall short, or you get shattered, or you get hurt in some way. And then, and then you say inside, this internal thing happens, this sort of vibration or this, this uh, whisper, of trauma that says like, I will never be hurt like that again. And so what people do is they retreat. They, they kind of get shoved to the sidelines and, they, and, and they're in a dark place. You know, they're not in the place that they want to be. So um, yeah, I think a lot of the book was trying to, un trying to understand those, that unexplored space, that sort of murky terrain that exists between you know, that safe spot where people find themselves in and the mountaintop, whatever that looks like for them. Uh, and in that unexplored murky space is the no barriers map that Buddy and I tried to illuminate um, in that narrative way. So a summit is really a metaphor, I guess, right? And I read a quote from you, a summit is less of a physical place and more of a metaphor for the meaning of your life. You can make your life what you want it to be. Yeah. Buddy, why don't you answer that one? I mean, you've been, uh, you're quiet over there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was <clears throat> letting you roll, and I really appreciate being on. Thanks. It's good reconnecting with, with Eric. Um, you know, I think uh, what I've, uh, one of the things I've learned working with him and um, studying the people that are, you know, that populate the book um, is that, you know, certainly summits, uh, if you go to a No Barriers Summit, you know, one of the annual summits that they have, um, you realize that there's all these different kind of people who share a certain desires and they want to, you know, the, their summits are individualized. And um, at these um, gatherings, you, you really learn that you know, everyone's summit is a little bit different and the organization of No Barriers provides these opportunities for people to figure out, you know, how far they're willing to go, whether it's climbing a man-made um, wall with help of some mechanical devices and um, technology to, you know, using um, prosthetics, their own people with various disabilities to learning how to, to kayak and be on water for the first time. I mean, their summit might be running a half marathon, but one of the things that I really found is that if you look at all the people in their stories and the people that Eric and I wrote about, and many of them he had met at these summits um, at different times, and I hope he'll talk a little bit about some of their stories, which are just remarkable. They share certain things, and it, it has to do with that um, thing that you're talking about with moving from can't to can. And if you look at a number of the examples in the book, you know, these characters, these figures, they're just, um, they have a certain grit and tenacity and ability to um, take themselves from can to can't, but they don't always do it in the same way. And I think that's one of the, the things that's really fascinating is 
how these different people are able to navigate their own challenges and you know end up on whatever summit theirs is yeah um before we go further i just want to ask you buddy how i know you help you're a co-author of the book how did you and eric first connect Mm -hmm. ah, okay yeah that that's a good that's a good question um i had been writing about this sport called adventure racing which were multi-day multi-sport endurance competitions and i found out that eric and this team were going to be competing in eastern greenland of all places and i thought wow what a what a great story this guy is going to be competing in a in a team-based sport that involves you know trekking and mountaineering and uh, rubber kayaking across like icebergs strewn fjords <laughs> and i was like i want to know how and how is he going to do that right and there's no trails in this part of greenland either so i managed to get myself over there and uh contracted to write an article about him and i ended up embedding in his team or with his team for the course of about a week as we tromped around uh greenland and you know i was and by Jess, who was uh, one of his guides up Everest, and uh, a woman named Cami, and a guy named um, Rob Harsh, and his teammates. And I, every day I was just um, amazed and mesmerized by uh, Eric's abilities. And they let me kind of help learn how to call out commands as we were heading up this one big summit. Um, called mm -hmm. Polemsfeld and actually we stopped on the mountain and I, I was getting kind of uh, exhausted and a little bit scared and we had to climb up this um, this metal ladder that hung out it was a 30 foot or so kind of vertical um, vertical climb and I it was high up there was about a 1400 foot drop off to the left and I didn't really want to do it I said you know I'm good I'm just going to stop here and Eric said, well, wait a minute, like, you grew up in Idaho, have you ever been to, like, this close to a summit? His teammates had told him that the summit was, like, 35 minutes away. Have you ever been to this close to a summit and then just stopped and not gone to the top unless there was, like, really bad weather or lightning? And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> so he said, watch this, and he just went up the, uh, he climbed up the ladder and showed me how to do it, and then I followed him. and. Uh, Watching him at that race in Greenland, uh, we, I just was hooked and I read his book and stayed in contact and continued to write about him and his exploits for the next decade or so. Yeah, I remember that summit. Uh, Jeff Evans, my friends, they don't really talk, uh, they don't really like, uh, you know, soften the blow too much. They, they, he said, uh, step left and you'll, you'll never see your wife and kids again. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, and, yeah, this piece reminded me of like the Matterhorn or something. And uh, yeah, but we found Buddy to be so funny and he was entertaining us. I can't really share all the jokes that he told uh, through that week uh, with, with the audience here. But no. uh, just, you got to trust me that he's, you got to trust me that he's really funny. And uh, he was so articulate and, uh, so when it came time to write this book, to be honest, with you, I was like, look, you know, Buddy was like, hey, if you, you should write a third book. And I was like, I, I don't want to write a third book. It's such pain. I fell into the total category of the no barriers people I wrote about. Like I was like, you know, sitting down to write a book. I mean, we're talking 10 hours a day of writing um, and, you know, for a year of my life that I'm going to get out of shape. I'm not going to be able to climb. I'm not going to be able to adventure. I don't know if I really want to do it. And he was like, look, I, I believe in this no barriers thing. I think together we could do something really incredible. And so Buddy was honestly like the biggest energy behind the whole process of the book because uh, once I realized I had Buddy aboard to help me along this writing process, um, I, 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 I submitted. <laughs> He submitted to a lot of donuts. Uh, well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. Um, getting back to your story, I, I think in life, um, 
there, well, first of all, I know, I, I read, Eric, you had parents who really believed in you and pushed you and encouraged you, right? Yes. So many people in life have, have are told the, the opposite. You can't do this. Why would you try? Um, you're not good enough. Uh, they're discouraged from trying. Pe people around them don't believe in them. What would you say to those people? Well, um, I mean, yeah, we write about a lot of people like that. You know, I was very, very lucky. My dad was really supportive. He was my partner and so many. I mean, like, it's sort of a, amazing to think that my dad supported me in all these crazy ideas I had. You know, he was there for every wrestling match uh, in high school. And he was there laying on his back with a telescope watching us crawl our way up El Capitan. He flew over the summit with my family over Denali when I summited Denali. He timed it perfectly. He hiked to base camp of Everest to see me off. So, like, I have a story that's uh, incredibly fortunate, uh, you know, in terms of support that I received. And yeah, we met a lot of people, you know, like in my first book, one of my best climbing partners, Sam Bridgem, um, not sure if I can say this on air, but I mean, his parents from the, you know, when he was a little kid called him and well, I'll just say it, an F up. You're an F up. You're an F up. I mean, you hear that? Like when you're a little kid, I mean, what a deficit you're crawling out of. So he always thought of himself, I'm an F up. And like, that's it's just that's a no barrier story that this guy sort of had to go through the hardship, uh, the adversity of finding his way without that support system. Um, but I think if people like that can connect with a really positive community, a really positive rope team, like the one we've created at no barriers, because no barriers, um, is a mindset, but it's also a movement. It's an organized movement of thousands of people. You come together in that kind of positive movement and you meet people and you start to realize that all this noise, all this clutter, right? Um, that's like weighing you down, that's saying you're the F up or you're, you know, you can't. All that stuff, you realize that you're looking in the wrong place. You're not, you, you know, you're looking out there, but vision is created internally. It's inside of us. It's a light that we grow and nurture and use to blaze into the world. So, yeah, I think people that don't have that early support are at a deficit, but they have to then consciously start to grow that light um, despite the world. Thank you for that. Um, on, not, on another side, just to share my own story, I have lupus. I was diagnosed when I was 16 um, it, or 15. It destroyed my kidney function and I've had two kidney transplants. And, I, and, then, the, and then the transplant meds led to lymphoma. So there were many times throughout my life I was told I'll never be able to do this. You know, <laughs> doctors often talked in terms of never, in terms of can't in terms of um, always, it, and innately, and it's maybe the person, I had this desire to go back to them and say, F you, you were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I think a lot of times we're told um, diagnoses or symptoms that we, that, that draw almost like a box. And we're told from now on, you're gonna to have to stay in this box. So for example, with lupus, the one thing they know about lupus is you can't go in the sun. And I grew up by the beach and, at this, and, right. I, and I was a rower on my high school's crew team. So the sun, I was always in the sun. So what I did is I tried to, I go, I never stopped going to the beach, but I go as the sun is setting. Hmm. So I just adjusted the time when I go and I learned to love that time of day when the sun is setting and that's when I get out there and do my thing. So um, for those people who have, whether it's diagnoses um, or real physical challenges, 
that paint a picture that we're gonna stay in this box, don't even try. And we're told you're never gonna be able to do this, you're never gonna be able to do that. What would you say to someone to take that first step that maybe you can, maybe there's another way, maybe it's worth trying something. Not to go against the doctors, but maybe there's a way around this. Yeah. What would you say to someone, to those of us, you know, someone who just lost a limb or someone who yeah. just became blind, that we don't, I think depression happens when we find ourselves in our own boxes, walled in by what we perceive as absolute limitations. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I can tell you've lived that story, that no barrier story, because you're describing it like exactly almost, almost exactly the way we wrote about it in the book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like, for instance, I'll just personally connect. I mean, when I went blind, I felt like there was a brick wall in front of me. Um, I felt like I was in that prison that you talked about, that box. And so you have, you know, people's expectations and perceptions of you are not very accurate. Of, of, of what we can do aren't very accurate because people, although they're loving and supporting, right? They want to put you in that box. They want to keep you safe. And that's fine. That's just what the world wants to do. They want to box everything in and, you know, kind of compartmentalize it and, and uh, categorize it and, uh, and, and, and keep it contained and safe. But for our psyche and for our health and for our happiness, that's not what we want. So we find ourselves inside these prisons. Now, the world puts us in those prisons, but at the same time, that sort of trickles down into our own psyche and we find ourselves putting ourselves in those prisons. You know, so I know that like my prison that I found myself in after blindness was partly self-induced. Mm -hmm. And I think the advice to people is, and this was, you know, throughout the book, we, you know, uh, let me back up a little bit and say that, you know, in terms of this idea of growth and change and transformation, you know, people write about these things in very glorious ways. But Buddy and I really wanted to understand growth and change by studying real people, not like fictional books and not like Hollywood and stuff. But, and we found that, that one, there's so much so much as part of that journey that's so counterintuitive right it's not the stuff you're taught it's it, as i mentioned earlier there is a map but it's kind of a grittier bloodier map than you would like to accept and so one of the things that we found was that to get out of that box it's scary as hell right um you're you know you're taught that you're supposed to overcome your fear but we found that nobody in the book ever overcame their fear. Yeah, they confronted it. They pushed it at the edges. They pushed the parameters of their fear, but they never overcame their fear, right? And so to get out of that box, you have to understand that it's, it's miserable to be in the box and it's scary as hell to get out of the box. But one of those choices leads you towards potentially something great, like towards change, towards growth. So which fear do you do you go for in your life? Do you go for the fear that of just sitting on the sidelines and being, you know, a life that's lived for nothing? Or do you go for the fear that leads you to someplace potentially amazing? So yeah, yeah, both are equal sides of the fear. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wanted to add too, Eric, that um, I think also what I learned um, in looking at all these people is that there's all, another approach too, which is to sort of change the box or change the shape of the box. Um, if you look at someone like Kyle Maynard, Eric, mm -hmm. who um, this, this gentleman was a, 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 a congenital amputee. So he was born with his, uh, his arms ended at the elbows and his legs at the knees. And, um, you know, so he, he started out with some, some deficits, but with, uh, and I was hoping that Eric, uh, you'd maybe tell the story about um, bath towels and, and packing tape, because I think it's a good illustration of how you get out of a one way that you can get out of a box. Yeah, Kyle was uh, 
a great example of that. One, he grew up with really supportive parents, as we, as you talked about earlier. So he was at a great um, advantage because he had this amazing support. Like when he would sit in the sandbox as a little kid and uh, his sisters would dump sand over his head. And so one of his great motivations was to figure out a way to dump sand back over their head without <laughs> arms and legs. <laughs> so, uh, and he learned how to do it. He was so proud of himself once he made that out of my kids. Stumped, stumped, dumped some sand on his sister's head. Uh, Success. He came to our summit, uh, our, you know, our big celebration of this No Barriers life. We usually have a thousand people all together. And it was in the mountains and he wanted to join our hiking clinic. And, it, you know, he didn't give us a lot of time. He signed up the day before. And we're like, look, I mean, we have, I've taught blind people to hike and paraplegics and amputees and all kinds of people, but you, have, you don't have arms and legs, Kyle. Like, I don't know, what are we going to do? So we, uh, we had this really cool engineer with us and some really smart people. And uh, we went to his hotel room and we got some bath towels and, uh, and packing tape and uh, um, foam and stopping bags. And the next morning, we pushed him to the base of the mountain and we got him out of his chair. They wrapped him up, his stumps up with uh, foam and bath towels and packing tape and some shopping bags. And Kyle uh, basically crabbed his way up the mountain. Um, he would crawl through the dirt, through the mud. He would kind of like do this crazy little somersault kind of thing over rocks, over piles of rocks. He would pull himself through the snow. Um, and eight hours later, we stood on the summit together. And um, he didn't stop there, right? Like, he, you know, he didn't just go, okay, I've done it. I've achieved it. Now I can go back and live that, like, you know, dark, ex safe existence. He, he, he used that experience as a catalyst because the next January, he climbed uh, Kilimanjaro, the tallest peak in Africa. The next January, he climbed the, to the summit of Aconcagua, the tallest peak in South America, 23,000 feet. Um, he kept developing his technologies. Uh, so he became like Robo Kyle with these amazing prosthetics um, and, and strengthened his team. And uh, now you can see Kyle on Nike ads. Uh, but yeah, so um, part of the way out of that box is this sort of messy map that I'm talking about. And part of that map is definitely one, we call it the rope team. It's this uh, team that you surround yourself with. It's the community that you use to support you, that lift you up, that elevate you, and you in turn elevate them. And it's also this idea of what we call pioneer, just like you have to, we have to see ourselves as a pioneer, always sort of developing new ideas and new strategies and systems and technologies. And uh, so No Barriers, our organized movement really tries to do that. We try to bring in the most cutting edge scientists and engineers and inventors to show people all the amazing adaptations that exist in the world, as well as the ones on the horizon, um, ready to, you know, kind of profoundly change our lives. And one thing I think, one thing that fascinates me about that story, the whole story is fascinating, but with Kyle, you know, a lot of times we say, well, even if we want to start, we don't have the resources to start, but you could start with bath towels and foam and tape and shopping bags then. Right? You don't need. 100%. Yeah. People are like, how did it get started? Well, right. bath towels and packing tape. That's the ingredient. It's always the same. <laughs> so you can't make, you can't even make excuses that I don't have enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources. Just get out there and work with what you have. Basically. You work with what you have. And here's the other thing. So all that stuff can take you to a certain place. But those things be, are the tools, the tools that then build um, what you have inside and helps you to grow what you have inside. So it's like this, like, uh, this kind of reinforcing thing that the tools kind of give you glimpses of the way forward. And then that reinforces what you have inside, starts strengthening and growing that. And, uh, and, and all those tools become a catalyst to what you're trying to grow internally. Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, my, next, my next thought comes around the idea of hero and being a hero. And I think um, the thing that's fascinating, I mean, there's many things fascinating about you, but um, when you look at society's expectations of someone without hands or legs, or someone, you know, after I had my first kidney transplant, someone said to me, why are you, st how are you standing? And I'm like, uh, I, you know, like their expectations are so low. I think when you think of someone who's blind, people expect, people are impressed when they get across the street without, when they get successfully cross the street corner, right? Mm -hmm. And here you are climbing the highest mountains in the world. So you take those expectations of society and turn them on their feet. Like, you know, if they're looking, saying, wow, that's impressive if you could cross the street and you're climbing the highest mountains, you're completely shattering the expectations of others. And that's why it's not only what you've done that makes you a hero, but the fact that, I mean, in my opinion, but the fact that you're, taking people's expectations and saying and and turning them around and saying this isn't going to stop me look at all that we could do yeah. and hopefully they'll set the bar higher because i, I yeah. think a lot of people have look at others with the expectation that you can't and you're saying yeah you could do what you could do is you know you're let living, me, um, you're let me let me qualify that just a little bit because I think that changing people's perceptions is a byproduct. It's not like a direct reaction because at least personally and the people that I looked at in the book, they're not like the world says you can't and they say, I can, and then they like go do it. It's not like a direct reaction, although it is a little bit of that. I mean, for sure, there's a piece of that. Maybe it begins with that. But the folks that really continue to climb and grow, and I don't mean climb mountains, I mean just climb through their lives, it becomes more of a positive uh, journey, like where they're really just interested in what they can do personally. You know, like when I climbed Everest, like I heard that, oh, you defied the world's expectations. I'm like, well, forget the world. I, pers I shattered my own perceptions of what I thought I could do. So what I found was that most people, they're not trying to be totally reactionary in the world. They're not like just trying to, you know, like I hate climbing, but I'm going to go climb that mountain because you said I couldn't do it. No, they really love what they do. And, and they're pursuing it with this incredible team around them and the pioneering mindset uh, that, that they built. And they want to experience life and adventure. Uh, they want to live fully and see these incredible natural wonders of the world and be a part of life. They don't want to be on the sidelines or in river terminology in the eddies, which are the stagnant places on the side of rivers. They want to be in the current. And that is a scary place to be. Um, and when they go and they fulfill that thing, yes, it shattered the world's expectations, but it's not because they're, you know, uh, they're directly trying to do that. Does that make sense? Yes, I understand what you're saying. It's yeah. Yeah, and I, if I would just add that I don't think also that most of the people in this book, and that includes Eric, of course, um, you know, are are heroes to me. Um, and but I don't think they would think of themselves probably as heroes or set out to be heroes. The the a lot of the things they end up doing would seem heroic to other people or you know they we're moved by them because they're quite remarkable i mean i think yeah. of of someone like mandy harvey eric who um you know is a, a woman who lost her hearing uh you know when she was in music school and was told you know she wouldn't really ever be able to you know become a choir director and um you know now she's moving she, she ended up um, learning how to play her ukulele and, and she sings with near perfect pitch and she ended up 
um, as a finalist on America's Got Talent and, you know, got like 120 million views because Simon Cowell gave her the golden buzzer. But Aunt Mandy Harvey, I, I don't believe, would think of herself as a hero. Do you, do you think, Eric? No, and she did this thing because she loved it, you know, right. not because she uh, was trying to prove people wrong. You know, she loved singing. Um, she wanted to teach singing. Actually, believe it or not, when she went deaf, she couldn't hear herself singing anymore, and she said it kind of freed her. So she became, in some ways, a better singer than when she could hear. And now she sings beautifully. But she, you know, it's not like a magical thing. She works incredibly hard mm -hmm. because she has like an, I don't, I'm not a musician, so, but she has like on her iPhone something that tells her whether she's on pitch or not. Uh, so it, it lights up a certain color so she can, you know, test her voice. She has certain um, notes and, and pitches that she is, is sure that are on, that are on point. Uh, so she kind of starts from a sort of, of a foundation and then she uh, can kind of like go through the scale and, and uh, in her voice and then she can actually now write music. She's written a lot of her own music and uh, you know, this is incredible. It's music that she'll never hear, but she performs it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so lots of people like that where, you know, they're not, they don't see themselves as heroes. You know, the heroes that I see are like the woman who hasn't left her house in a year and she's uh, at our summit climbing and, uh, you know, trying all these new adaptations. Um, or a person who came to the summit once and she uh, just wanted to walk down a set of stairs again after this injury. And we gave her some tools to be able to do that. Or uh, there's a lady with MS that comes to mind. And she wanted to ride bikes with her kids. Um, and with MS, someday she, had, you know, she just couldn't do it. And so we uh, had one of our engineers uh, connect an electric motor to her bike. Uh, and she was zooming around with her kids. So it, it, people have the desire to break through these barriers. And it's a very personal thing for them. And it's not always climbing Everest, right? Because I think in a way that's sort of demotivational for people where they're like, well, I'm never going to climb Everest. No, that's not the point. These people, you know, it, they want to break through barriers in their lives and they are desperately trying to figure out the ways forward to do that. And those barriers are very important to them. Uh, and so, and they, they take all different shapes and sizes. Um. You, I read a quote where you said, we've been taught that growth, that growth is a dice sweeping arc upward with a crescendo at the top and violin music playing, but it's not. Growth, I found, is like a volcano spewing lava. It is messy, it is tumultuous. What about failure when people don't just set out, and whether you have faced failure or other people have faced failure, how do you, do you learn through that? How do you cope with getting out there and trying something but not succeeding? Yeah. Well, I mean, climbers, for instance, in the climbing world, if, if you're a world-class climber, you summit, you know, 50% of the time at best. In fact, if you're summiting 100% of the time, it means you're not picking ambitious enough goals. <laughs> So there's sort of a correlation between the extent of our reach uh, and our success. <laughs> so um, if we're trying really hard things, we're gonna, we're gonna succeed less percentage wise. So um, yeah, no, I think there's great ideas to be learned through failure, you know? I mean, nobody goes out and sets out to fail. And uh, you know, like when I failed on Amit Ablam, which is a peak that we went to as a team before Everest. You know, we ran out of food and fuel and we had these really bad storms. We had a guy who fell and uh, we had to put him in a hyperbaric chamber, a portable hyperbaric chamber and pump air into the bag to bring him down to lower altitude, uh, get a helicopter into base camp and uh, fly him out of there so he could save his life. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a disaster, um, but that is the trip where we came together as a team. We learned about how we could trust each other and rely on each other. Uh, we learned about a bunch of like shortfalls in like our organizational kit. And um, that 
trip, even though we failed, became the energy, became the catalyst to, you know, like we, the mountain provided a barricade that we crossed through. And it was through the process of crossing through that barricade that we became a team. So we needed that experience um, to, to climb Everest. I think it was that experience that sort of galvanized us uh, to having success the next year. So yeah, sometimes failure can be kind of a, a, a process of alchemy, what we call in the book alchemy. It's this process of turning lead into gold and sort of using those failures, those hardships as a catalyst that propel you forward and they become the pathway to growth, not the enemy to growth. And so it's another sort of crazy counterintuitive thing that we learned through the process of studying uh, this journey. Yeah, I think if you're not failing, you're probably not trying hard enough. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, and that applies to whatever you're doing, whether it's, you know, writing books or um, climbing mountains or, or kayaking. Um, but I did, you know, want to add that because we haven't really touched on it, um, you know, in relation to the idea of failure, uh, in, in watching Eric's journey with rivers and with kayaking, um, you know, most people who, who learn that, well, he, he kayaked the Grand Canyon, but when you start at the beginning of the story and you realize what it took to get to a place where he was even pointing a kayak down the, the Colorado River, <laughs> there was a, a hell of a lot of, uh, of failure, wouldn't you say, Eric, yeah. uh, en route, um, you know, and it took him six years uh, of trial and error and learning systems and developing tools to be able to even attempt something that um, ambitious. And there's a fascinating part that runs, theme that we found that runs, ran through the book way more than we thought. And that is like how the brain can grow, how the brain works, how incredibly resilient the brain is, but also how fragile it is. And so in my experience kayaking, I got in over my head on the river in Mexico, these gigantic whirlpools that sucked me down. And I got traumatized. I couldn't get back in my boat for a little while. And when I thought about kayaking, I just got overwhelmed with sort of dark feelings and um, anxiety and fear. And I thought that was the end of my kayaking journey. Um, I, it just... As I said, it became kind of like a trauma, like a, a vibration that I couldn't get through. And so, you know, we, I went and used the soldiers that I've worked with at No Barriers, a lot of these injured soldiers who come home with post-traumatic stress disorder, and really tried to understand that process, how people go out and get traumatized and then just kind of get stuck in place. And so what I realized was that I couldn't move forward like in that traditional way. I couldn't just suck it up and push my fears aside. So I went back to the Whitewater Center, which is in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I relearned to kayak. I pretty much had to relearn the whole process. I had to relearn my, kayak, my combat role. I had to relearn how to go through little tiny rapids. Uh, this is like a, a man-made river that you can go practice on and do the same run over and over and over. And so I took these little tiny baby steps trying to relearn and um, eventually rebuilt myself. But it's, it taps into this whole amazing science on neuroplasticity, which is like when something gets damaged, the brain has an ability to reprogram itself, to recircuit itself, to find new pathways. Um, but it takes a big commitment. Sometimes it means going backwards and kind of rebuilding. And uh, that's part of the philosophy of No Barriers. Um, we take people on these transformative experiences, um, whether it be youth or soldiers or people with physical challenges, and give them that space to kind of rebuild their lives after some hardship. How does someone get involved with No Barriers? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, they can... Uh, go to our website, which is uh, nobarriersusa.org. They can learn all about us. Um, we actually have in October, October 4th and 5th, you know, we have a big, uh, what we call our summit in 
no, none other of places than Manhattan, than the Big Apple, <laughs> because we wanted to, and I know you're, you know, most people who live in the city don't call it the Big Apple, so I just sounded like a total dork, but, <laughs> um, but we've had our summits all over the mountains, um, and we usually expect about a thousand people. We have them in these beautiful places uh, in the mountains, but we decided that if we wanted to really get into the mainstream of thought leadership and culture and media that we'd, we needed to really test this idea in the big city. So we are coming to Manhattan for two days. We're expecting 5,000 people. Um, our first day will be on the Intrepid, uh, which is the aircraft carrier. And uh, the second day we'll have this incredible no barriers adventure race through the city. And then uh, that night we will have uh, a concert in Central Park, No Barriers Live. And uh, it'll be two days celebrating this, this, this life that we're all trying to build. And by the way, this is not just people with physical challenges or people who are blind. This is every single one of us, right? This is, these are people who you know, struggle with all kinds of things, like kids in the foster care system, kids who have, people have struggled with uh, death you know, in the family, um, people who, with fear and anxiety and, and, and self-doubt. Um, you know, we're kind of all together in this no barriers club. That's kind of the beauty of it. Uh, and I guess the tragedy of it. <laughs> um, could you say your website again? No barriers, USA.org. So yeah, check us out, learn about us. We have lots of events. We have lots of programs. If you know of a veteran or a youth or somebody with any kind of challenge that might benefit from one of our programs, send them our way. And since you're in New Jersey, we'll see you there too. Yes, yeah. I, I, I just uh, thought of that. I would, love, I would love to go. I will talk to you about that. I would love to be there. Awesome. Um, um, one last area I just wanted to explore, if, if it's okay. Do you, do, you have, do you have time for one more question? Yeah. Okay. Um, parents, parenting. So you are a parent. And um, what could we do to instill our children? What could we do to be the best parents possible? What, what do you think to motivate our children to help them out of their own boxes if they have any, to help them see their own potential? Um, regardless of, regardless of, anything that might limit them, what do you feel uh, parents could do to help, to help inspire and motivate their children forward in life? Well, I think there's, all, there's a part of it's just kind of an osmosis. Your kids see you trying to struggle. Like when I was learning to kayak, my kids were uh, next to me in duckies, which are inflatable kayaks and rafts, and they were playing on the river, and I'm struggling and learning to kayak um, and they're watching me go through that struggle um, and so I think part of it is an osmosis if you um, as a parent are honestly authentically trying to learn and grow and involving your family in that process uh, your kids will catch on but I think you can you know like instead of taking vacations and just like sitting on the beach or something take the time that you have with your kids, spend it all in some kind of pursuit, some kind of learning process, some kind of uh, engagement process where you're all kind of committed to something, to learning a language, to uh, learning a new culture, uh, to kind of put, putting yourself out there in a vulnerable way as an entire family. Right? Really instill that no barriers idea in, within your family. And I also think it's uh, something that we talked about in the book, which was, um, you know, as a parent, you're so scared to let your kids go out and get out of that box. You know, you want to, as parents, we, we, our love sort of consumes our kids and, you know, you want to stick them in the basement and just feed them and keep them safe and <laughs> it can't happen. Right. I mean, it's like, so it's another counterintuitive thing of parenting is that, you know, the way I can, describe my parents is like being a broom in a dustpan, you know, my mom, well, my dad would sweep me out into the world and I'd get kind of shattered and beat up. And then I, then they'd rebuild me. Uh, 
and then uh, they'd sweep me out into the world again and I'd get shattered again and then they'd pick up the pieces and rebuild me and then I'd get swept out into the world again. It's, it's incredibly counterintuitive behavior as a parent to be able to sweep your kid out into the world. Be, but, but that's how they have to discover, right? They can't discover through your wisdom and your uh, mentorship and all that kind of stuff, although that's part of it. They have to grow that light inside of them. And they have to have opportunities to do that and not be overshadowed by the parent's love um, or protection. That's great. Buddy, any, any final thoughts on that? Oh, well, I totally agree. I mean, I'm a parent of, of two children and... I think, um, you know, Eric spoke about osmosis, but also I, I do believe it's, it's pr providing great, a great model by taking risks. And, you know, I always tried to do things with my children that were a little bit um, on the edge that pushed them out of their comfort zone. Um, I, and it's not always something that everyone in the family um, thinks is a great idea. <laughs> I had a, an example. Well, I've spent a lifetime for some reason jumping off of high things and usually it would be either into snow or water but where we live in North Idaho there's a bridge that uh it's a trestle bridge rail bridge over the Clearwater River and it's probably 30 feet off the the water and in I used to take my kids out to there and we would you know I would go swim out into this big pool before and use swim goggles and make sure there was nothing um, dangerous underneath because we were planning to leap from this bridge and my children would probably be like 10 and 12 or something um, 10 and 14 and my wife Cammie would watch us walk out onto this trestle bridge and you know just sort of holding her head and looking the other way and I would always swim under and check and make sure like I said that there was nothing that could hurt them but there you know you can't really see underneath the surface of the water and then I would leap in there and 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 swim around I'd, you know take this jump and a leap of faith and into the water and then I would swim and tread water and wait and encourage them and sort of beckon them to leap uh, but they had to do it on their own you know and and they would sometimes stand there for a very long time uh, and then they would leap invariably and you know, it would be okay. Um, and so it's, I, I always think of that as a kind of metaphor where you have to, you have to take that leap and it wasn't, you know, crazy or foolhardy. It wasn't really super dangerous, but there was, it was scary. And, you know, but it was also something that bonded us together as a, it's sort of small, but I like it. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, do, do we, do you either, I think, Buddy, you have a copy of the book. Do you want to just hold it up? So I do. It's right here. Here's the cover. Uh, okay. That's Eric plunging into the most iconic and dangerous rapid on the Grand Canyon, Lava Falls. Um, that was my body double. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end with this quote, and then I'm just going to ask you if you have any final thoughts. So there's a quote I read that Eric said in an interview no matter how big the mountain is, it is climbed step by step, moment by moment. If you can relax and let go, you're not just going through the motions. You're aware of every moment. You're excited. You're celebrating every moment. At the end of every day, I would celebrate. I told myself that no matter how high I make it up the mountain, I have to celebrate that as my summit, and that has to be success. And when I did that, it was a turning point. I love that. Um, Eric and Buddy, any final thoughts? Well, I, I mean, I was, you know, I meant on that quote, I mean, that passage and is that, yeah, I mean, I think the brain is a really complicated thing. Um, in writing you no know, barriers, you know, a rapid we learned has all the stuff underneath the surface. Um, you know, you're riding the energy on the surface of the water and you think like, okay, all this energy is happening on the surface, but really it's created from so far down deep under the river, like all these boulders and drop offs and what they're called sieves. And I mean, all this sort of pile ups of rock and debris under the water. And uh, so, yeah, so much of understanding our journey is diving down beneath the surface. Rain. You have to dive down and really kind of understand what all that, all that debris 
and all those obstructions in the brain, like what are, you know, how are those affecting my awareness? How are those affecting my life? And so much of, you know, the way that we uh, move forward in our lives is uh, either enabled or prevented by that debris, you know, at the, you know, deep down in our, in our brain, in our psyche. Uh, so part of the journey of No Barriers became trying to understand um, what's under the surface. Yeah, and I think I'll just close by saying that, um, you know, the book, and working with Eric on it, I came to realize that, that in a lot of ways, you know, rivers are these tremendous metaphors for life and the journeys that we all are on. But, you know, that the, there's these pockets of turbulence that we encounter and and it's it's in that it's in those areas where you know where change happens um and it's it, but but also there's a line kayakers realize that if you that it, there is a line through rapids it's the best way to go it's the way that's going to get you through without um flipping you over and tipping you out of your boat and potentially ending in a disaster and so i think if you read this book, you realize that um, it's actually a kind of map. It's a kind of line itself through life's rapids. That's wonderful. Boy, this has been really special. Thank you to you both. It's been, an, it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. And um, I look forward to seeing you in New York City. Awesome. Yeah, we'll see you in a couple months. Thank see you. you. Like that. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you both.